Good morning to everybody online. Give y'all just a few minutes to join with us this morning and hope you've got your cup of coffee and sitting by a warm fireplace or got the heat roaring in your house because it is cold outside. So we're glad to have y'all this morning and good to have everybody that's here this morning. And uh, hopefully we'll have a few more join us here before long, but um, we want to go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. And um, we, we still have a lot of prayer requests. I want us to specifically remember Jen this morning. She is preaching in Demopolis today. So uh, excited for that opportunity, but we want to uh, we want to lift her up and remember her this morning and uh, that the Lord would speak through her and calm her nerves. And so, Jim, when you watch this later, we're praying for you for sure. Um, we still have a number of folks that are battling COVID, um, battling the long-term effects of COVID and what it's done. And we uh, need to continue to remember Brother Broadhead. Um, he is still struggling and uh, having some issues there. Continue to remember Miss Lynn. Uh, Bobo is doing better, um, still needs a touch, still definitely needs a touch in his body. Let's continue to remember him. Um, Sister Maggie Morgan, um, and continue to remember Sister Peggy and, and her family, and um, continue to remember the Golden family. Miss Debbie is still not doing well. Um, at all. So please, please pray that the Lord would intervene there uh, in multiple ways if you would do that this morning. Um, uh, need to continue to remember Rebecca and Terry and um, all of our missionaries and our lost family members. And um, I'm sure there are probably some folks that I have forgotten. Um, just anybody have a prayer request that we need to add this morning? I got a cousin that got COVID. Just, just to kill it. Okay. All right. Just continue that next place to come on. Yes. Need those back where they belong. Amen, brother. Uh, my husband has a cousin that's also been put in the hospital uh, today with COVID and not doing well. So, do you remember them? Anybody else? All right. Well, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. And uh, so, let's do that at this time and just ask the Lord to be with us today. God, we love you. We thank you for your mercy and your grace and your love toward us. And God, this morning on Valentine's Day, Lord, we're just reminded that there's no greater love than that you sent your son, Jesus, to give his life for us. And we thank you for that. Thank you so much for that. And this morning, Lord, we, we bring these needs to you, God, those that are struggling over COVID, Lord, those that are uh, battling just with illness in their body, God, those that are struggling with cancer, Lord, and and just the various issues that we have going on, Lord, those that, uh, Lord, that are, are, are battling in their minds, Lord God, those that need peace and those that need uh, relief from anxiety, Lord, those that are struggling with uh, dementia, disorientation, God, that's, that's, um, that's bringing confusion and turmoil to them, God, we pray that you would just speak peace into those circumstances. And God, we lift those to you, especially that are battling cancer today, God, there's um, so many of our loved ones, Lord, that are that are facing these situations. God, we ask that you would minister in their bodies as well. God, we lift Jen to you this morning, God, as she's ministering the word in Demopolis. And I pray, God, for that service today, Lord, that you would anoint her, God, to bring your word and calm her nervousness that might be there. Lord, we lift our missionaries to you as well, God. You see the need in each and every circumstance and situation, Lord. We, we lift Brother Mac to you as well. You know the need that's there in his body today. Lord, we, we don't have anybody in this room that is not affected by having a lost loved one. And God, we, we lift our lost family members to you, asking, Lord, that you continue to show mercy in those circumstances and that you would, uh, you would prick their hearts, God. You would send persons by their way that, that they could listen to, that they could hear your word one more time, God. And, and give them another opportunity to respond. And we thank you for that. Lord, we pray for our services today. Lord, for every Sunday school class that's going on right now, Lord, uh, right up through our worship time, God, we just ask your anointing to rest here. And, and Lord, as we divide your word today, I pray that you would help us to correctly divide your word. God, be with us during this time of study. Father, and as the threat of, of ice comes our way, Father, I just pray a, a hedge, a shield of protection, Lord. Uh, Father, we, we love to see pretty white stuff, Lord, but we don't like what, what it brings. And, and I just pray, Lord, that there would be safety. What about you would keep your hand on each and every one. God, we commit this time to you. And again, we thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. 
Everybody said, amen. 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 Y'all come on in. Good to see everybody this morning. So, we are uh, continuing in our study from the book of Mark. And we are on Mark chapter 13. We're going to do the entire chapter this morning. So um, that's where you can turn in your Bibles if you're following along with us uh, online. And we're going to talk about Jesus is going to teach about the end times. And um, how many of you are interested in that particular topic? End times. Um, there's been a lot of movies, a lot of books written on end times. There are, uh, are a lot of, of people who speak specifically on that. There's a lot of ministers who share specifically on that. I may even remember a number of years ago, we, we had a friend of ours come through that brought in the big map, the big chart, and talked about end times and everything. It's fascinating. It's, it's interesting. We're curious about that. We want to know what, what is going to happen, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. That, you know, God gave us a curious mind and, and you know, we, we just, we want to know these things. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to know that. But it all needs to be put into perspective. And this is what we're going to see happening this morning. Uh, Jesus himself kind of brings his disciples back around and points them in the direction that they need to go. And so that's the direction that we want to be pointed in this morning. So our central truth today is we must be prepared for Christ's return. Now, I could ask each and every one of you in here, we have a wide variety of ages in this, in this classroom. So I could go from the oldest to the youngest, and even the oldest person in here, uh, and I'm not going to, I think that's going to be Papa, okay? Papa Roy, you've been talking about the Lord coming back since you were a little bitty, right? The fact that he's not returned yet does not mean he's not coming, Right? That's right. Okay. So we are to look for the, what we call the imminent return or the return at any moment of Jesus Christ. Okay. This is what we are to do as his followers, as his Christians. Okay. Um, but we got to be prepared for that. We need to, and, and this is what Jesus is interested in, is preparing us for that. Our, our uh, key verse this morning is Mark 13, 33. And I'm going to read the NIV version because I think it's just, well, we'll read them both. King James says, take ye heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. The NIV, I like the way it says it. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when the time will come. Okay. You can't get any plainer than that. Keep your guard up. Be alert because we don't know when he's coming. Now, when we talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the word gospel itself means what? Good news. The good news of Jesus Christ, okay? Um, so when we start looking, we start talking about prophecy. We start talking about the, the end times, okay? Um, it's a mixed bag. There's some good things going to happen, but there's also what? Some bad things that are going to happen, okay? Even, think about that. Even in Jesus' lifetime, he experienced bad and he experienced good, right? He had to go through an awful lot through his trial and the cross and, and all of that before he had the victory of Resurrection Day, right? So in the process of, of the gospel... While the gospel itself is good news, sometimes the process of the gospel brings difficult times. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is what we're going to see today. Um, we're all going to face good times in our life and we're all going to face hard times in our life. If the Lord tarries, we're going to begin to see even more hard times coming in our life. But we're not to be discouraged by this. And our lesson today is saying, be alert, stay awake, pay attention to what's going on. If you are, then you have no need to fear, okay? And so that's what we want to hold on to today is we do not need to fear what is coming down the road. We don't need to fear what is going to happen to the United States. What is going to happen here? What is going to happen there? We don't have to fear the events that we read about in the book of Daniel, the book, book of Revelation, okay? If we're keeping our eyes on Jesus Christ. So we're going to find in Mark chapter 
chapter 13 today that Jesus just has a very candid conversation with those who are closest to him. Okay, just a small group of his disciples that he's talking to here. And he's going he's gonna to have a candid conversation with them. He's just going to, they ask him some questions and he begins to respond to them. Okay, and we're going to see as, as how he addresses this, we're going to see that he places some priorities on where their minds need to be. Okay, our minds can get so bogged down and overwhelmed with everyday events. How many of you have ever been there? You just get bogged down. You get, you get flustered, whether it's something going on at work that you can't control, something going on at home that you can't control, uh, you know, how much the cost of your prescriptions are this month, how much, you know, you, you're, you hit a deer in the car and you got to fix that and all these different things. And, and they just kind of come in and after a while, they almost dull our senses. Uh, and, and sometimes we get to the point, I saw somebody... Uh, put a put a meme on Facebook the other day where they just kind of had their head in their hand and they said, I thought 21 was going to be better. Let me just go back to bed. <laughs> it's like, you know, but you can just kind of get bogged down on all of these things, okay? And so Jesus is telling his disciples throughout this chapter there are some things that they need to focus on. They need to get their eyes set. Um, I have, most of y'all know, I, I battle vertigo really, really bad. Some days it's worse than other days. When I'm having a really bad flare, I have to put my eyes on one thing. I can't be looking around like this. Don't take me to the grocery store if I'm having a bad vertigo day. I will fall on the floor. I cannot, you know, I can't look. I have to focus on one thing until I get my head straight, okay? Well, that's very much how we need to think about this this morning. We can get so worried about what this scripture says and what this scripture says and what's going to happen here and what's going to happen here, and it makes our head spin. And so we've got to keep our eyes focused, and this is what Jesus is going to point to this morning. So again, we are in Mark chapter 13. We're going to pick up at the very beginning right there, okay? Um, and, and we're going to see, like I said, um, that Jesus is going to have a candid conversation. So let's read verses chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. It says, and he, and I'm reading the ESV version, by the way, it says, and as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what beautiful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Okay, that tells us they, they were in a small group right there. They asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, now look at this first sentence. The very first thing he says, see that no one leads you astray. Wow. Wow. Okay, continue. Verse 6. Many will come in my name saying, I am, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumor of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. Okay, just the beginning. Okay, just like we as believers have questions today, his disciples had questions. They walked with him, they talked with him, they, they interacted directly with him, but they still had questions. And so back in this particular day, uh, Jesus was coming out, out of the temple area right there, and the disciples were marveling at the beauty of the structure, okay? It was, history tells us it was gorgeous. King Herod at that time had expanded the temple and he had added all these different things to make it just really beautiful and glorious. He kind of did that as just a gesture of goodwill. 
um, to the Jewish people whom he was ruling over, but he, he made it, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous place. And they were commenting, just like you might if you're driving down the road and you see, you know, oh, look at that beautiful house. Look at that gorgeous church. Look at that beautiful building right there, okay? They were commenting on the temple and how beautiful it was. And Jesus took that opportunity for a learning moment, okay? And he spoke to them at that point. And he says, yeah, you see these great buildings as beautiful as they are? Well, guess what? There's coming a time when not a single one, not a single stone is going to be left on top of another. It's going to be totally, totally destroyed. Okay? That, where did that come from? I mean, I, I would imagine if you were one of those disciples, you're like, what? 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 You know, we're talking about how beautiful this is, and you're talking about it's going to be destroyed, and I don't, you know. So this uh, automatically left them with some questions, right? Uh, so so I, I picture in my mind that, you know, they're probably walking along as they're talking, having this conversation. And so what does Jesus do? He just maybe crosses the little road, the little street right there, and there's the Mount of Olives. And so he goes over there, and he just pulls up a rock, <laughs> and he sits down and says, let's have a talk. You know, let's, let's have a talk. We're going to have a candid talk this morning, okay? Um, so they're at, they begin to ask questions. It said, verse 3 tells us that as, as he sat uh, opposite the temple on the Mount of Olives, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when's this going to happen? Tell us about this. What we want to know, we want to understand all this, okay? And as we read through the chapter today, we're going to find that Jesus tells them a little bit. He tells them just, just what they need to know. He doesn't tell them exact details. He tells them a little bit. But his first response tells us where his heart is and what he wants his disciples to hear. Okay. We talked about last week the fact that Jesus didn't beat around the bush. Jesus, when he said something, he said it for a purpose. He said it for a reason. And, you know, when, when they teach you speech, I don't know how many of y'all ever had speech in, in school, okay? But when they teach you speech, as you come in and you open to give your speech, you're supposed to lay out your points. Then you come back and you expound on each of those points. And when you end your, your speech, you're supposed to recap those points, Okay. So that tells you that the very first things that you say are typically the most important. One of the things that when we went online and we started um, doing everything online, especially for that time frame when we were closed completely and we couldn't meet, um, you know, we had our, our district had meetings and they would get all the ministers together on Zoom and we'd talk about how do you do this and what's the best way to do this and how can we get this across. And one of the things that, that they expressed was, People are not going to sit and watch you online forever. You know how when you're sitting in, in front of your TV, if, if what's on that TV doesn't catch you in the first five minutes, what do you do? Click, click, check. Do you know how many people I talk to, and if you're guilty, shame on you. <laughs> you know how many people I talk to that say, oh, I've really enjoyed uh, my church time since COVID hit. And I'm like... Yeah, I just cruise all the sermons on Facebook. I listen to a few minutes of this one, and I listen to a few minutes of this one, and a few minutes of this one, and I'm like, then you're not getting anything but a smorgasbord of confusion, okay? You know, listen, but, you know, one of the things that they said was, don't belabor your point. Get to your point. Talk about what's most important, because you're not going to have a captive audience for very long. Uh, I had to watch myself, because... When we were just at home and we were having to uh, stream online, I couldn't stay in the same room as my husband and be able to operate the camera and put comments and all that kind of stuff. We had to have him in one part of the house with the camera going, and I had to go to another part of the house on my stream because the internet service was not strong enough to keep us both going. It would either drag his down and it would cut it or Mine would be delayed, and I was commenting, amen, praise the Lord, when he was saying something bad, you know, it's like because it was delayed. So I would have to go to another part of the house. Well, after a couple of weeks of that, I would find myself on Sundays 
well, I'm listening to this, you know, and he's out in my piano room and, and I'm in the house listening to this. Well, I'm going to go ahead and go put that pot of water on to boil. So, you know, tea will be ready or whatever. And you could find yourself and all, before you knew it, you're distracted. Okay. So Jesus starts out. He knows he's got a lot to tell these disciples. But he wants the very first thing that he says, okay, to, to get within their spirit. And we know this because he repeats it multiple times throughout our passage today. Jesus says, watch out that no one deceives you. See that nobody leads you astray. Many imposters are going to arise. There's a lot of things that are fixing to happen. Be careful that you are not led astray, okay? He goes on to say, you know, nation's going to rise against nation. There's going to be, you know, famine. There's going to be earthquakes. How many of you saw uh, there was an earthquake in Japan uh, yesterday? Our, our missionary there is fine, but it was a frightening thing, you know. But we're hearing earthquakes um, all, all the time. Um, famine is definitely a situation that's going on. Wars and rumors of wars. You know, we're seeing this and everything seems to be on the increase. And Jesus says to them, don't be alarmed. These things are going to happen. This is, this is what is going to take place. This has to happen. And, and he says this is just the beginning of birth pains. Okay? You know, those ladies of you in here who have had children know that, you know, especially with that first child, you don't just... Oh, I'm in labor. Here's the baby. It's, it's a process, okay? And some women labor long hours, you know, hours, hours, even to a, a day or more, you know, before that baby ever arrives. So as we begin to see all these things happen, it doesn't mean that the end is right then. But Jesus is saying this is the beginning of birth pains. This is the warning sign that you know it's coming, Okay, so sit up and pay attention. So let's pick on up in, um, in verse 9. He says again, verse 9, but be on your guard. Okay, be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils. You will be beaten in synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, don't be anxious beforehand what you're going to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it's not you who are speaking, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay, now why is Jesus talking about all of this? Why is he suddenly saying to them, you're going to be delivered over to councils, you're going to be beaten in the synagogues, you're going to stand before governors and kings. Why is he talking about this? Is he trying to frighten them? No. He wants them to be prepared. He wants them, he wants them to be prepared that this is fixing to come. Um, persecution began immediately after Jesus' death and resurrection. Now, technically, it began prior to that, but the focus of it was on Jesus himself. Okay? After his death and resurrection, what, where did we find the disciples? After his death, what did they do? They went and shut themselves away. Okay, why? Because they feared the same thing was going to happen to them. Isn't it amazing that right after his death, they, they locked themselves away. They were fearful. But after the coming of the Holy Spirit, what did they do? They, the Holy Spirit gave them boldness and they went out and they took the gospel everywhere. Okay, that shows you the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus even talks about that at the end of this couple of verses we read. Don't be afraid. The Holy Spirit's going to be with you. Holy Spirit's going to give you what you need. Okay, but he's wanting them to be prepared. Now, the warning that he gives is predominantly is right there to the disciples. As you begin to share the gospel, persecution is going to come to you. These things are going to happen. You're going to be called to stand and give an account uh, before leadership and rulers. And these things are going to happen to you. And, and we saw this in the history of the church. As you read through the book of Acts, you will see that, that his words were true, right? We saw the, the church persecuted. The, the early church persecuted. But what sometimes we forget is the disciples started the work 
of sharing the gospel, but they didn't finish it. Okay? Whose responsibility is that today? Ours. Okay? So this word, you know how we talk about a lot of times when you read something in the Bible, it has a, it has a meaning for that present moment, but it also has a meaning for future generations. Okay? So this is also serves to be a warning for us as well. As we continue to share the gospel, we continue to spread the word of Jesus Christ. We're going to, you know, if, if the Lord tarries, we're going to see persecution. And I'm not just talking about, you know, well, you can't take your Bible to school. Okay? I'm talking about we're, we're going to see persecution big time if the Lord tarries. And Jesus did not want them to be caught off guard. He told his disciples, be on your guard for the coming persecution. But he didn't, he didn't want them on guard so they could avoid it or so they could escape it. He wanted them to be on guard so they wouldn't be caught, surprised by it, and they would be able to know how to respond and how to get through that what to do at that particular point right there. Um, and, you know, he goes on to tell them some of the things that they could expect. Why well, Jesus is talking about being beaten or being flogged, and what happened to him? He was beaten, okay, before he went to the cross. Um, think about Paul. Paul was flogged five different times for the gospel, okay? Uh, a couple times left for dead. They beat him so bad they didn't think he was going to survive, and they just left him for dead. So, you know, each of the disciples that have come down the way, if you go back and you study each one of the disciples and you study out what happened in their life, um, it's, it's powerful to see what they went through. The majority of them were martyred for the faith, okay? And yet, each and every circumstance that we have an account of in the Bible, we find that the Holy Spirit did what, just what Jesus said that the, he was going to do. He was always there with them. He gave them the mercy and the grace and the, and the wherewithal to work through that particular situation. So he wasn't telling them these things. So these things are going to happen. So you go run hide in your house and don't let them find you and maybe you'll be okay. No, that's not what he said. He said, these things are going to happen, but you don't have to worry because the Holy Spirit's going to be with you. The Holy Spirit's going to help you through those times, and the Holy Spirit's going to tell you what to say when you have need of coming up with, some, with, with what you need to say. Um, it, is, it is God's desire that the gospel be shared in every nation. We have boots on the ground or have had boots on the ground just about everywhere now. And through the internet, radio, television, you know, we used to think about radio and television, you know, and back when I was growing up, I used to think, okay, now how, what about out in the boonie somewhere where they can't have a television or they can't have a radio? Or I just couldn't imagine how the word of God was going to get to those areas, okay? Never imagining that one day we would have we would have little like transistor radios that are solar powered don't have to be plugged in anywhere they're called proclaimers i don't know how many of you we had a we had a missionary guest that brought one with them they're called proclaimers and they're they're little bitty things just about like what we would have known as a transistor radio back in our day growing up and they are, they are programmed with the gospel message, with the scriptures on there. And they get these into remote villages in the language that it needs to be, and they're solar-powered, and so they can get a, a proclaimer into a village, and it will share the gospel in the language of that people group, and they can recharge it just by it being in the sun. That is amazing, when you think about that, okay, they don't even have to have the internet service there, but we can get the gospel in all these other places. Then you think about all the places that we have internet service. We have, um, we have a project now where iPads, okay, they are, um, they have developed a, um, an app to go on an iPad, uh, actually with the Logos program that they can put 1,400, 1,500 books just, you know, you walk into pastor's office and there's a wall full of books right there, okay? Well, he carries more books now on his computer and his iPad than could possibly fit in several libraries right there. 
Well, they are equipping native pastors now with iPads that have all of that on them. And nobody stops them from bringing an iPad into a country. Everybody has iPads, right? So they can take an iPad in where they couldn't take a Bible in, okay? So when you stop and think about what technology has done, we get aggravated sometimes at technology, but when you stop and think about it, it has allowed this passage to be fulfilled, that the gospel is being carried everywhere now, okay? We still have work to do. There are still people that have not heard, but what is this telling me? We are very much closer to the return of Jesus Christ because we're seeing this happen. Okay, so let's pick up in verse 12 now, and we're going to read quite a few verses right here. Uh, starting at verse 12, we're going through 23. And so he says, the, the last thing he's just left us with is, you don't have to be afraid. The Holy Spirit's going to help you in this time. And then he says, verse 12, brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father, his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. Okay. Notice, I, I find that interesting right there. He doesn't say, if you can endure to the end, you'll be saved. That would be a speculation as to whether you were going to make it or not. But he says, the one who endures is going to be saved. So that, to me, brings hope that, yes, we can endure this. Yes, whatever, whatever comes our way, we're going to stay steadfast in our faith and we will be saved. Okay? Okay. Reading on, verse 14, he begins to share with them some things, some signs that are going to be leading up to the return of Christ. He says, but when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation that has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ... Look, there he is. Do not believe it. For false Christ and, pro and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But here he goes again. Be on guard. I have told you all this beforehand. He's saying, I'm telling you this. Listen to me. You ever had a, a child that reached out to touch a hot pot? And you said, don't touch that, that's hot. And they keep on, and then all of a sudden they reach out and touch it, and they burn themselves, and what's the first thing we want to say? I told you, I told you that was going to happen. I told you, okay, Jesus is warning us. This is three times, three or four, I've lost count, times that he has said, be on your guard. Be on your guard, okay? Um, he, he's saying the times leading up to his return are going to be filled with distress, and he warned them specifically about false prophets, false messiahs. Are you, have you ever seen in our lifetime so much false, so much fake that's coming out? I, it, it just kind of blows my mind. But it's, it's a fulfillment of prophecy, actually, okay? But he's sharing all this. But again, his primary concern is that people would be on guard, be alert, that they would recognize deceivers and not be, not be taken in by them, okay? How do we do that? One of the questions I asked on our Facebook page was, why are so many people so easily deceived spiritually? They don't stay in the Word. They don't stay in the Word. That's exactly right. They don't stay in the Word. So that's, that's what puts them at, at risk, okay? Um, Mary, you've dealt with money. A lot. How, how can you tell when a counterfeit bill comes across? I think the first thing is the feel of it. Um, and more, they 
basically you're just the more you're around the money, the more you recognize the counterfeit. Okay, so you've handled the real so much. You know what it feels like. You know what it looks like. And so in something that comes across as a close duplicate, you, you feel that difference. You see the difference that's in it. The only way you can do that, you know, I wouldn't know, basically. I had that happen to me one time. I had someone that paid me in cash and gave me a $100 bill. And when I took it to the bank to deposit it, I was told it was a counterfeit. Where did you get this? You know, and we tracked it all the way back. Well, that person had gotten it, you know, had, had been passed to them. And that, I had no idea it was counterfeit till I took it and put it in the hands of somebody that handled money all the time. And they immediately recognized it. So here's the thing. If we're not handling the word of God, if we're not in the word of God and know what the word of God says, we can be deceived. And the more I study the Bible, the more I find out I don't know. Anybody else like that? The more I study, the more I know I don't know. And I, I dig in, and sometimes I find things that I've believed all my life that I have misinterpreted. When I really get into the scripture, you know, uh, and, and we've been talking about this a, a lot lady, uh, lately. Uh, one of the courses that I'm taking, uh, I read a statement to my husband last night. I said, listen to this. And I read that, and I said, have you ever thought about it like that before? He said, no. And then the very next thing out of his mouth was, I got to go study that. <laughs> I said, yeah, me too. You know, I don't, I don't ever want to take what I read that's not in the Bible. I don't ever want to take it without going back to the Bible and, and going through and making sure of what I'm understanding. Okay. But Jesus is talking about something right here that, that would be particularly devastating. And he's talking about brother against brother. He's talking about father against child and child against parents. He's talking about your own family, okay? Turning against one another. And that, that brings a level of hurt or a level of pain that is so much worse than somebody else. You know, a friend turning their back on you or a stranger, you know, betraying you or something like that. that. That's not nearly as devastating as a family member, okay? And Jesus is saying, in the last days, even family members are going to turn on you, you know? Uh, they experienced this. They began to experience this as they began to share the gospel, okay? But nothing compared to what it's going to be like in, in that day. Now, he uses a term up here um, that we have to go back and look at. In verse 14, he says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he, he ought not to be, what is the abomination of desolation? Those are two huge words. Any thoughts on that? Is that something that you've studied at all? Okay. What, there, there's several things that this particular reference could be referring to here, okay? And depending on the scholars that you talk to, uh, there are some that stand strongly with one opinion and with another. Most of them feel like that it's like we've been talking about with the Bible. It had a present meaning and it had a future meaning coming up, okay? So one of the things that it points to here, uh, and if you, we're not going to take time this morning to go back and read all these scriptures, but if you want to write these scriptures down and read them this afternoon, um, you can see the references that are being made here. Daniel 9, verse 27. Daniel 11, verse 31. And Daniel 12, 11. So I would just say read Daniel 9 through 12, okay? And that's going to help you out right there. Daniel prophesied, okay, uh, about, about this abomination of desolation, okay? And it was partially fulfilled with, by, by a uh, Greek king uh, named Antiochus Epiphanes. And I'm sure I butchered that that pronunciation there. But he was a Greek king who came in and built a pagan altar on top of the altar to God. Okay? That was a desecration 
of the altar, okay? That took place right there. Then they also saw what happened in AD 70. This is like after the time of Christ. What happened in AD 70? The temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, okay? And false worship was established, okay? And then it is predicted, okay, the fulfillment of what's going to happen. The Antichrist is going to come in, and what's he going to do? He's going to set himself up as the Christ, okay? So when we, when we finish out this scripture, we're going to see where if you don't understand that it had a meaning for them, but it was also a, a type or a shadow of what was to come, you can get really confused and you can say, well, the Bible's contradicting itself. It's not. You have to go back and study out all these scriptures to understand this, okay? But most, most all of your scholars believe that when Jesus is talking about the abomination of desolation, he's, he's talking about this whole, this whole scenario, okay? What happened then, what happened in AD, what was to come in AD 70, and what was to come with the Antichrist right there, okay? And so, you know, he tells them during this time, there's going to be a lot of false prophets come up. There's going to be a lot of people who's going to say that, you know, hey, I'm the Christ. They're even going to perform miraculous signs and wonders. We know that the Antichrist is going to come across like that, right? That's how he's going to set himself up right there. And he's saying things are going to be so terrible that if God did not cut those days short, no one would survive. But for the sake of his people... Okay, God, God was going to cut that time short in there. Okay, but he tells them, uh, verse 20. No, let's see, I'm ahead of myself. Verse 22, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. Who are the elect? The believers, right? Okay. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen a time in your lifetime where more people that you thought were solid are just turning their backs on God? How many of you know at least one or two people that you thought were solidly based that have just totally turned their back on God? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. You can talk about people uh, in their pride, you know. Well, I was watching you and I'm Soros. I mean, you all heard of Soros. Mm-hmm. He was the richest people in the world. He said he was God. He didn't have to believe in no other God. He yeah. You think about that. Yeah. That's pretty strong language. Mm-hmm. So you're right. We have, we have athletes. Don't we, Chris? I mean, Chris is smiling and nodding back there. Yeah. We we have athletes who have set themselves up basically as God. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but but the thing about it is, you know, we we think, I, I never thought I would live to see people just walking away from Jesus. Just walking away. And I never thought I would live to see the elect being deceived, okay? So what does this tell us? Do we have to get all scared? Do we have to worry about this? No, but we do have to be on guard lest it happen to me or lest it happen to you, okay? So Jesus is saying when this begins to take place, watch out. Watch out. Be on guard, okay? He says, be on guard. Don't let this catch you off guard. I've told you it's coming. I told you if you put your hand on that hot pot, you were going to get burned. So he's saying, I told you to watch for these things. So why are you so shocked when you see it happening? Okay. While believers can look forward to the joy of being with Jesus in eternity after his return, that good news also includes the bad news of judgment upon people who don't accept him. We pray every Sunday morning in Sunday school, we pray for our lost loved ones, okay? What are we doing besides praying? 
We need to pray. I'm not, I'm not taking that, you know, I'm not belittling that. But what are we doing besides praying? Are we tr do we truly grasp what judgment is going to look like for those who do not endure to the end with Jesus Christ? Do we truly grasp that? If all believers could truly grasp the full meaning of the judgment to come, maybe we would be more intentional about reaching our friends and family and indeed all nations for him. Now, as we go on and we read verses 24 through 31, uh, it, he starts talking about things that are going to happen in nature. Okay? Things that are going to happen with, this, with the sky and with the earth and things that we're, we're going to begin to see. He talks about the sun being darkened and the, the moon uh, won't give out its light. We're in verse 24, right here, 24 through 31. The stars will be falling from heaven. The powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Okay? Jesus is going to return with such authority when he comes. With such authority. There's going to be no doubt who he is. He's not coming as a baby in a manger. He's not coming as a meek lamb. He's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. In authority and in power. Okay? And he's saying these things are going to happen. All right? Then he tells them. Go ahead. Was somebody going to say something? Okay. All right. Um, then he tells them, verse 28, from the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as this branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, why is the fig tree such a big deal for Jesus to be talking about? In the South, we know that, right? Well, you know, in the winter time, the leaves fall off, and then as spring comes, you know, winter begins to fade, and, and you can see the buds coming out, and then you see... In Israel, the fig tree was, it was one of the few trees that loses its leaves in the winter. Okay, so he uses that as a prime example right here. And he says, so when you see this happening and you see the fig tree beginning to bud and, and you see what's happening, you know that summer's not far. It's not long off. He's saying, learn a lesson from that. I'm telling you these things that are going to happen. When you see them happen, understand that the end is near. Okay, recognize what is take, taking place. He says, verse 29, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. He is near, okay? Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not, take, will not pass away. Verse 30 is what throws us off. And it's what a lot of people will use as an argument to say, well, the Lord's not coming back because he told the disciples that their generation would not pass away before they saw all these things and that didn't come to pass, so that means the Bible's not true, okay? Well, there's several ways that we can look at this passage right here, okay? Now, there are some people that believe that he was talking about that generation, the disciples right there, okay? If that is the case, if he was talking about that, then the abomination of desolation did occur in A.D. 70 when the temple was destroyed. And that group of men, by and large, that generation, saw that happen. Okay? If that's what he's referring to right there. But again, we talk about scripture has a meaning for that time and it has a meaning for the future, for, for us. Okay? So it's more in keeping with verses 24 through 28 to see these events referring to not only the fall of Jerusalem, but the time of the great tribulation, okay? And when he says, this generation, okay? He's talking about all these things that are gonna happen. And then he says, this generation, or this generation that I'm talking about will not pass away before this happens. Have I, have I made that clear or have I muddied it up more for you? He you know, you, you can be talking about, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy to give you here. Um, maybe I'm talking about something and I'm, I'm talking about Henry Todd, okay? And, I, and I'm talking about something and I can say, this generation, you know, 
This generation that I'm talking about, maybe I'm referring to something that's going to, you know, with him. Or I can talk about, you know, um, my brain is just totally gone blank here with a good analogy for this. But, but Jesus referring to the future and saying, the generation that begins to see these things, their generation's not going to pass away before they see the completion of these things, okay? So in other words, if you see this beginning, you're going to see it to the end. You're going to see, does that make more sense now? Okay, all right, maybe so. I'm, I'm failing at that. I'm sorry. Um, many believers that, many believe that this generation refers to the future generation who will see all of the events of Mark chapter 13. They're going to see that taking place. And when they see that taking place, they're going to see it through to the end. Okay. End time events are going to bring the followers of Christ persecution that goes hand in hand with discipleship. But Jesus assured them that the words of truth he had spoken to them would remain firm forever. Verse 31, heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? My words will not pass away. Okay. He had spoken to them the word. And that was the certain foundation of their faith, regardless of the circumstances. Okay, verses 32 and 33. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Was that number four or number five times now? He said, be on guard. Keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of class about, you know, we had had our friend that came in that put up the big chart and that explained all the dispensations and, and what was going to take place at the end and talked about the book of Revelation and everything. And I said, that is totally fine to want to know about that and to study that. But we can become so consumed with the mapping out the details of what's going to happen. Is this going to happen first? Is that going to happen first? When is this going to happen? And when is that going to take place? Okay? I, I learned something. I told my husband this yesterday. We, uh, as cold as it was, Henry Todd had a soccer game yesterday. First one he's ever played. So you know my mom and papa were going to be there. You know, you just have to be there. So we bundled all up and we got out there and we were just literally, you know, shivering and, and freezing and, and, and everything. And uh, of course, I took my camera. And when my kids were growing up, I had a little, just a point and shoot. Everything was automatic. And I would be up in the bleachers or, you know, trying to zoom in on where Tyler was on the football field or where my girls were on the basketball court. And I wound up getting a picture that you couldn't even see them, you know? Well, now I have this wonderful camera that's got a telescopic lens on it and I can sit just about anywhere and like, it's like they're right there, you know? And so I was taking pictures, but then there came a point where I stopped, I put my camera away and I just enjoyed the game. I got a few pictures. But I got to thinking back when my kids were growing up, I so desperately wanted to capture that moment that I spent so much of my time on those games trying to get just the right picture that I didn't even see the game. You ever done that? Okay. The Lord is warning us not to get so caught up in the details of mapping out this situation that we miss the main point, okay, that we miss. It's not about mapping out the details in the book of, of Revelation. Jesus gave this teaching to warn his disciples, be ready, because nobody knows when the time is coming. Don't worry about all the details. You need to be worried about being ready yourself and getting people around you ready. If you will put your focus there, then you don't have to worry about the details that are coming down the pipe because it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay because you're going to be ready, okay? Um, Jesus repeatedly turned the conversation around to highlight their own need to be ready to face adversity, to be watching, to be alert, okay? Now, the question here is, some people get hung up when it says, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, only the Father. 
And so people say, well, now how can that be? Because Jesus is God and doesn't he know everything? Sure. But what was Jesus when he was doing this conversation with the disciples? He was man. He was in the form of flesh when he was talking. And what did he do? He was fully God and fully man, but he laid down some of his rights. He laid down, okay? He emptied himself of those attributes that basically would give him the advantage, okay? He, he lived life as a human in its fullest sense, relying on the Holy Spirit the same way that you and I rely on the Holy Spirit. What would he have accomplished if, if he could snap his fingers and make things go right? You know what I'm saying? So at, at this particular time, as Jesus walked on the earth, he emptied himself of those things. So the son, in the form of flesh, in the form of man that was standing there talking to them, did not know. Okay? He was, he was in human form. When he died and was resurrected and ascended back to the Father, what did he do? He picked up those attributes again. So yes, of course Jesus knows. But he was talking as from the vantage point of, of a man, okay, when he was saying these things. Does that make sense? Have I, again, I don't want to muddy stuff up. Um, so, I want to say something right Yes. Uh -huh. if, if, he, if God had told him when, if he did know, if he had told him, It'd be just like us now trying to figure it out. We'd wait, we would wait till then yeah. to get saved. Exactly. Christ. Christ wants you saved all the time, not when you be ready. Exactly. But uh, if we figured it out, and we, don't, we are always trying to figure it out, but we don't figure it out because he wants us to. He wants us to be ready, just like he said in the end. It just goes back to what we were talking about, a lady who is pregnant and, and goes into labor, okay? You know, the time to pack your bags and be able to get all those things that you're going to need is a couple weeks before that happens, okay? You don't want to, you know, I've, I've been one of those ladies that had to go unexpectedly way too early and didn't have anything that I needed, you know? You don't, you don't want, we need to be ready. And he just continues to emphasize that over and over and over. Be alert, stay awake, be vigilant, okay? Almost every one of us has participated in something that has made us wait. Whether you're waiting for a bus, you're waiting for a plane, uh, you know, you're waiting for church to be over, you're waiting for Sunday school to be over. And what happens? Fall asleep. We fall asleep. We nod off, okay? Um, in the absence of activity, it's easy to go sleep. Now, that's a mouthful of words right there. In the absence of activity, it's easy to go to sleep. Jesus compared this to a man who leaves his servants in charge during his absence. And in this parable, as we continue the, the rest of this chapter right here, in the parable that it shares, the homeowner assigns each servant a task to perform, including a special task of keeping watch assigned to one servant. Between Jesus' ascension and his return, each of his followers have been given gifts that we are to be using for ministry to perform faithfully as we watch and wait for him. If we are falling asleep, it is probably because we are not doing what he's asked us to do. We are not utilizing the gifts that he has given us. We've become inactive, okay? And what happens when you become inactive? You stagnate, right? There's no movement in a pond. What's going to happen? The water's going to stagnate, okay? So because we don't know the time of his return, Stay awake. You know, verse 35, Therefore stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you to sleep. And when, what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. That's number five, six, whatever, in this one passage of Scripture where Jesus keeps going back and he says, Stay awake. Watch. Pay attention, be busy, be active, be alert, stay awake because the time is at hand, okay? Jesus spent about three years with his first followers, teaching, preaching, eventually dying and rising from the grave. We as his followers will spend eternity with him. But for this present time, he has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. We don't have to fear the future. 
We don't have to fear whatever's coming down the pike, okay? Because the Holy Spirit will be right here beside us, helping us maintain our firm in our faith in every circumstance. To he who endures, what did he say? We'll be saved. He doesn't say if you endure. He says the ones who endure. That means it's possible Okay, we stay awake, we stay alert, we be active doing what he's called us to do. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fear. Let's not be so caught up in worried about the prophetic. Okay, let's not be so caught up and worried about is this going to happen or is that going to happen. Let's be caught up right here in the word of God, feeding off of his word because this is our security. This is our firm foundation that we stand on. The Holy Spirit is with us and we don't have to fear.